Paracord has so many uses in the bushcraft and survival world. I always make sure I have a roll of the stuff in my pack somewhere. One of the great things about it is that you can attach it to different parts of your kit, so that if you misplace the main roll, you have a backup option. Take the carrying D loop for example. I cut off roughly a meter and a half of paracord and loop this evenly around the carrying handle of the pack. I take the left hand piece and wrap it over the right hand piece and under the shoulder strap and back through the loop on the right hand cord. This forms the beginning of my wrap, which is known as a cobra weave. I then do the opposite motion on the other side. So I take the right hand cord, wrap it over the left cord and back through the loop made on the left hand side. Then I gently tighten it. Then it's just a case of repeat the process on opposite sides. If you forget which side to start the weave again, just look for where the previous loop was made and continue the weave from there. I continue to work my way down the carrying loop and then when I get to the end, I either tie it off or as it's paracord and can slip fairly easily, I just cut the tag ends off and then burn them with a lighter and compress the melted paracord down so that it pinches in place. Now I know I will always have over a meter of paracord on my backpack, which I can quickly deploy for using to make a bow drill kit for firelighting or replacement shoelaces for my boots or even a guy line if one breaks or frays. There are many uses and it's all here ready to use on the outside of my pack. A dry bag is another great option to keep in your kit. When not in use, they roll down very small and take up little space. Aside from being a great way to prevent wet kit from getting in the side of your pack more wet, you can actually create a makeshift pillow and better still, you can even add an insulation layer to it. Cut a small rectangle of reflective material, either a mylar blanket or another form of reflective material like this waterproof thermal insulation membrane, stuff it inside the dry bag, gather some leaves, ideally you want dry leaves, but at the time of filming this we had some heavy rainfall which meant the leaves were wet. But with the dry bag being totally waterproof, it doesn't matter too much. Once you've stuffed the dry bag full of leaves, secure the top and within minutes you have a comfortable pillow. You can adjust the height of the pillow by adding or removing more leaves. The reflective material will help to keep your head warm on the colder nights. When you're done, simply empty out all the leaves and roll up the dry sack. You can keep the reflective material in there for next time. The first aid kit. Hands down, the most important item in my pack. Over the years, I've managed to scale down my first aid kit to a small pouch that can fit in the cargo pouch of my trousers. That way, if I leave camp to collect firewood, or if I'm doing a long hike through difficult terrain, I have easy access to my individual first aid kit. The most used items within this kit tend to be nearer the top, as these help to treat the most common injuries I get, which are cuts, occasional burns, and splinters. And so when I first open the pack, the first items are plasters, bandages, and a tick remover. Beneath that, I keep burn cream, a mirror, a small whistle, and then on the other side, pain relief medication. There is more detail than that, but I've covered that in a video on my channel before. What I wanted to highlight here is the grey package that is attached to the back of the kit. This is an Israeli bandage, which is an emergency bandage used to stop bleeding from traumatic injuries. This I can easily just pull straight from the back of the first aid kit and apply to the wound as quickly as possible. It's the one item I hope I never have to use in my first aid kit, but it's also the one that I want readily available. Another small pouch that is always in my pack is a tool sharpening kit. This tiny bag holds a sharpening stone for my axe, a leather strop with some stropping compound, which I use almost daily to hone the edge of my knife, and finally, a DC4 combination sharpening stone, in which one side has a fine diamond stone and the other has a special ceramic stone. If my knife is quite dull, I will begin with sharpening the diamond side, which will help to restore the edge to its original shape. Then I will flip the stone over and deburr the edge of the knife lightly using the ceramic stone. This gets the knife back to razor sharpness. I'll finish off by stropping the knife on the small wood and leather strop. 
The great thing about these sharpening stones is that you can use them without oil or water. All of these are necessary to have with me out in the field, so that if any of my blades get a nick or start to dull, I can keep them well maintained. The humble acorn, dropped from the majestic oak tree during the autumn months. A common sign at this time of year, and there are a number of uses of acorns, from making flour, to using the tannins from processing them to dye leather. But there is another great survival use for these little nuts, and that is a whistle. The top of the acorn is normally covered by a cap, known as a cupule. This protective tough outer shell protects the delicate embryo enclosed by the kernel. Most of the time, it's disregarded. But if you gently place the cap between your thumbs, roll your knuckles together, and pull the tips of your thumbs apart to create a V-shape, you can then blow air into this V, and it will create a sharp whistle sound. This sound can actually be incredibly loud, and the camera does not do it justice here. It's also a great skill to teach young kids, who have not yet quite mastered the art of whistling with their fingers. But this could help you out in a survival situation, where you need to call for help, but perhaps shouting just isn't quite loud enough. You can create a similar effect with a bottle cap. Just like the acorn cap, the inside of the bottle cap acts as a chamber. The air reverberates in this chamber, creating the whistling noise. The technique is exactly the same. Create the V-shape with your thumbs and blow air sharply into this V and over the edge of the cap. Another great use for a bottle cap is to make a fishing lure. First off, you need to make two small holes in the edge of the bottle cap. You can use your knife if it has a very fine tip, or if you have a multi-tool or Swiss army knife that has a reamer attachment, you can use this. Just gently rotate the point of the blade back and forth until you have made a hole in the edge of the cap. Do the same at exactly the opposite side. Now attach a split ring to one side, and on the other side attach your fish hook. It can be a single hook, or if you want a better chance of landing a fish, then a treble hook would give you greater success. Now gently fold over the bottle cap, but leave just enough of a gap so that you can put some BB shots or any small stones inside. Adding these small weights not only help the lure to sink so you can target fish at different depths, but it also makes the lure rattle, which will help to attract fish to the lure. And there you have it, a simple fishing lure made from a recycled bottle cap. With the amount of people littering these days, there's probably a high chance that you'll find a bottle cap in the wilderness. Please guys, take your litter home with you and leave no trace. Don't be that person that leaves it behind. Whilst on the topic of fishing and survival, you can actually make a complete compact fishing kit using a small stick. It's called a hobo fishing reel or hobo handline. They are dead simple to make. I cut a green stick about two inches in diameter and roughly eight inches in length. Obviously, the larger the stick you cut, the more fishing line and tackle you can store in your hand line. However, it will also then take up more storage in your pack. I then make a stop cut about one inch from the end of the stick. I make a second cut about one and a half inches up from the first one. I don't make these cuts too deep, just enough to be able to remove the bark. I slice away the bark, and this will be where the fishing line will be stored. The deeper you make the area, the more fishing line you can store. But as fishing line is generally very thin, you don't need to make this too deep. You would be surprised at how much line you can fit in this area, and given that it's a hand line, you're not going to be casting the bait or lure for miles. Then I make a hole at the opposite end of the stick. For this, I used a thinner blade, as it allows me to get a deeper hole. Rotate the blade back and forth, slicing away material as we go. Next up is to make a cap for the storage compartment. Carve away some material on the small stopper cap, enough so that it will pinch down when pushed into the storage area. Then I tie on the fishing line to the spool using an arbor knot and wrap this around the spool, spreading the line evenly as I go. I use a piece of Gorilla Tape to keep the fishing line from unraveling on the spool. You don't have to do this next stage, but I made a grip for the handle using some bank line. To finish off the handline, I secured a float to the outside using an elastic band. 
This is a great project to do in your spare time or on a rainy day. And you can make all different types and styles of handline. And if you're wondering whether they work, here is a clip of me sea fishing off a cliff. This time using a lead weight instead of a float. It's not ideal conditions, but I do manage to catch a few fish. Be sure to read up on your local laws and bylaws when fishing with handlines, especially in freshwater fishing where it could be banned. The UK sits within the northern temperate zone, and being an island surrounded by sea, we have a maritime climate. This means that we often get a lot of rainfall, especially during the winter months, which means the ground is wet throughout most of winter. And so this can mean that resources for firelighting are often wet. Tinder like dead grass can work great for firelighting, but if it's wet, you will struggle to get a fire going. A great way to dry out your tinder is to first break up the fibres and rub it between your hands. This will help to expose the drier fibres within the material. If you roll it against your clothing, the material will absorb the moisture from the grass and help dry it out. Chances are your tinder will still be damp, so store it in your pocket so that your body heat will help to draw out the moisture. After an hour or so, you will start to notice the tinder will have begun to dry. This will make fire lighting a lot easier especially if you are using traditional methods like flint and steel or using a cramp ball fungus. Autumn is a great time of year for foraging. Many berries have ripened and are ready to pick and a number of trees will begin to produce nuts. We mentioned the acorn earlier in the video, but arguably one of the best nuts to forage is the sweet chestnut, which is produced by the chestnut tree. The Latin name is Castanea sativa Look for large, narrow, lanceolate leaves with obvious serrations on the leaf margins. When you find these, the chances are you will see the spiky casings that hold the sweet chestnut itself. These protective casings are called cupules, and if you are lucky enough to beat the squirrels to them, you can harvest a good amount in a short time period. Just peel back the spiky cupule to reveal the sweet nut inside. The nuts themselves contain tannic acid, and so it's best to process them down first to make them more edible. The best way to do this is to roast them over a fire. You need to split the outer casing of the nut first, otherwise they can explode. After 20 minutes or so, peel back the outer casing and enjoy the sweet goodness of the chestnut. The sweet chestnut has a high amount of vitamin C. Just half a cup contains 35 to 40% of your daily vitamin C needs. However, they do lose some of their vitamin C content the longer you roast them for. You can even grind them down into flour and combine it with other ingredients for cooking. Another fantastic wild edible is chicken of the woods, or sulfur polypore. Fairly easy to identify, this fungus can grow on the stumps of oak, cherry, sweet chestnut, willow and yew. You need to be aware that whilst this is edible, as with most mushrooms and fungi, it's best to cook it beforehand. It's also best not to eat any that have been growing on the yew tree, as the toxic alkaloids from yew can seep into the fungi and if ingested, could make you ill. Stick to oak, cherry, willow and sweet chestnut. There are not many toxic lookalikes to this fungi. It really is one of the easier ones to identify. To begin with, it has a globular fruiting body and is sulfur coloured. As it matures, it fans out into the large bracket-like fungus you see here, and then becomes pale yellow. Once it turns an ivory colour, then the taste becomes more bitter and woody. As the name suggests, this tastes almost exactly like chicken, especially the texture. It's usually found from May through to August. I hope some of these tips have been useful for you. I do appreciate you watching, and if you enjoyed the video, please feel free to subscribe and be sure to check out my wilderness survival skills and bushcraft tips playlist in the video description below. There are over 20 straight to the point episodes for you to watch. Also, drop a comment if there are certain areas of bushcraft and survival that you would like me to cover. Cheers for watching folks, and I'll see you in the next one.